Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce to you Ivanova Smith. Ivanova is a well-known disability rights activist with autism. They are a leader in the Washington self-advocacy movement and have held le leadership positions with self-advocates in leadership, or SAIL, People First Washington, and allies in advocacy. They meet with state and national legislators to discuss issues that affect the disability community. Ivanova was an adjunct faculty at Highline College and is currently a self-advocacy faculty for the University of Washington Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities Program, or UW-LIND. They are happily married with a beautiful five-month-old daughter, Alexandra, who's here in the audience contributing to this presentation. Thank you very much. Welcome, Ivanova. Thank you. I am very excited to be here, and today I'm going to just talk to you about the history of true inclusion, the history of how we got to where we are today in disability justice and disability rights. Um, and it's a long journey, and, and I also am going to be pointing out that, you know what, there are still things that we need to improve on. There are still things that are, are making it so that people with disabilities are being uh, discriminated against. And so I want to bring awareness about these issues and also talk about the history. And I also have my contact information up there, and I also have business cards if you want to talk to me afterwards. <laughs> so first, the history. Um, less, uh, a big part of why people with disabilities were discriminated against was because of an idea that people with disabilities were seen as inferior. And they were seen, the genetics, the genes, were seen as bad genes that, uh, that people with bad genes should not be allowed to breathe and be able to have children. Um, the medical model was a model that's been widely used since the early 1800s when science started to become a very popular thing. And a lot of different type of popular sciences came out of the woodwork where everybody was talking about all these new scientific things coming out of research. And one of those things was the uh, Charles Darwin theory of evolution which um, his cousin, Francis uh, Glayton, uh, took the ideas of Darwin and was like, hey, this, uh, this I like. I like your ideas, Darwin, but I'm going to twist it to support this other idea that he created called eugenics. And eugenics was the idea that there were superior humans. And the survival of the fittest that Darwin talked about supported this claim that, oh, the only the fittest will survive. And we should support this so that only the fit get to live on the earth. And so that's how we had a lot of uh, science around getting rid of disability, fixing disability in the medical model because disability was seen by the eugenics idea as inferior. And th those are genes that we want to get rid of. Uh, eugenics also was a very racist ideo uh, so ideology. And I don't know, uh, I think I would call it like a fake science or a, um, a, a bigoted science. The science that um, it was used to hurt people. and so. We even have some ideas about eugenics today, like the idea of IQ and certain races have better IQ. That is a very eugenics idea. Um, and IQ is used a lot against people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to hinder us from immigration, actually. Uh, during the, when eugenics area was very popular, it was also during the big immigration boom in Europe coming to the U.S. in the early 20th century, and the way that they kept immigrants from coming into the country is they did these uh, specialized IQ tests, and 
uh, immigrants were not able to get into the country as well because they were very uh, language based and uh, not uh, respecting the people's languages, different languages. And so eugenic ideas were very racist. Frederick Clinton himself was a, a def definitely what we would call today a white supremacist. Um, he believed that white people, white healthy, you know, quotation marks there, uh, people should be able to breed, and that was positive eugenics. You know, healthy people breed, the unhealthy people, the, what he saw as immigrants, people with disabilities, um, people of different races, those were the people Francis Glenton thought shouldn't be allowed to breed. And so, um, because of his um, research, and, a, a eugenics caught on in the early 20th century, and that's where we get a lot of the oppressive po policies that hit people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I'm really gonna focus on the developmental disability community because that's where I come from. I'm a person with a developmental disability. That's why, personally, my knowledge and who I work with the most, but um, history of the disability community outside of developmental, you know, so there's parts where they connect, but other parts where um, there's the division, and I've talked about that. But eugenics hurt all people with disabilities. Um, so uh, we had uh, also the mental AIDS theory that was heavily supported by uh, the medical model. So you had eugenics and the medi uh, uh, mental AIDS theory that was used to say that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were mentally children, that we, uh, even after we turned 18, that we still had the minds of a child. And so a lot of our rights were taken away because of that aspect as well. It, w it was because they thought, uh, some people would say, oh, well, these people can't breed because they're mentally children themselves, so they shouldn't have children. And so that's where we get a lot of mass sterilization of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There was a famous case bu called Buck versus Bell where this happened. A woman named Buck, uh, Carrie Buck, was forcibly sterilized uh, and she lived on a colony for people with IDD. So uh, the, there was a mass institutionalization and her mother and her were forced onto this colony, and because the the doctor, wa who was Dr. Bell, wa said, she shouldn't be having any more children, she just had a child, we need to stop this, I'm gonna, we should forcibly sterilize her, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was kind of like a, uh, a dramatic case, it was dramatized to kind of just get all of this approved federally, so that uh, people in institutions could just get massively sterilized uh, and the Supreme Court would say, oh yeah, it's okay. Uh, Judge Holmes said that three generations of imbeciles is enough. So that was his view of people with IDD back in 1920, 1920s. That was Judge Holmes of the Supreme Court. And so that's where a lot of mass sterilization and institutionalization, uh, it was, that's where the numbers were the highest within that time period, 1920 to the 1940s. Uh, we also had another model, was a, the model of pity. And it, I kind of think uh, the infertilization of people with IDD, the whole, the mentally children, kind of plays into this because it gives the idea that people with IDD Oh, we should pity them, those poor children, those poor children. And I've actually seen people do this. Even today, you know, we see some ads or some inspirational type thing that kind of makes the DD person look very much like a child and innocent. And, and it really, people with IDD, we're, we're just like anyone else. But uh, there's this historical stigma that, oh, we should be pitied and, um, we, we, we're not capable of a co um, contributing and being successful and being professional, but always just seen as, oh, the pitiful child. That, that's another historical aspect of, and that comes from the charity model. 
Um, and then the criminalization of people with IDD. So um, the reason why, oh, and you may not be able to see it down there because the uh, captions, but uh, I have mass sterilization and mass institutionalization there. And so in the institutions, and I've actually looked at the documents for this that during the eugenics era, the institutions would actually call the patients their inmates. They used the same language to talk about prisoners in a jail as they would talk to, about people with IDD in a, in, in, a, in a colony or an institution. And they, these institutions were huge. They were like mass institutions and they were paid by the state to um, incarcerate these people with IDD for just because they were people with disabilities. And, Everybody thought, oh, well, we ought to just hide them away and not allow them to reproduce, and then they would just disappear. And that was the idea, and that's um, all we can just, you know, f and the other aspect of it is some of them we could try to fix. The higher functioning ones, we can train them to work, and oh, that'll make us look good because uh, we'll try to say our school is a training school. And so a lot of these institutions that you see today um, in Washington, we actually have four of them, uh, mass institutions that imprison people, mm -hmm. and they're called schools. They're called state schools. They're not called, oh, this institution. It's called a state school because they try to have the idea that, oh, we're going to train these people to not, mm, uh, we're going to train these people out of here and just train these people, but that never happened, and a lot of these places became warehouses mm -hmm. for people. Um, because of the abuses at these institutions, um, because they're starting to just be warehouses, and uh, the, they, the, they were thought to be signs of neglect. And there's actually a famous uh, news story of um, exposing the abuses at Wallerbrook School in Pennsylvania. And uh, that story, um, triggered the mass deinstitutionalization movement. And so a lot of people that were institutionalized in mental institutions, people that were, um, people with physical disabilities that were institutionalized, um, started advocating against these institutions and started demanding them being closed. Um, we had the exposure of Wallerbrook and then there was an expose of Penn State and also, and so you start getting a lot of these expertise of these institutions where there was horrible abuses happening. And there's still abuses in these institutions today. Um, uh, so that's when the institutionalization movement really came in. And that's during that, that time with the 1960s, 70s time. And so we also had like president, this time period, 1960s, 1970s, was a big boom for civil rights for people with disabilities and people of all different types of marginalized identities. Um, the biggest thing uh, for people with disabilities was that uh, we started to say, we started, there was a media attention about these institutions. Uh, one example would be One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That movie came out and so the abuses of mental institutions for people with mental illness and that's where we get the mad pride movement for people with mental illness against these institutions. And we also, during that time, President Kennedy, before he was uh, sadly killed, started developing programs for people with developmental disabilities, and he actually created the uh, association of, back then it was called the Association of Mental Retardation. It was like the National Association. And then it, it changed its name now to AAIDD. And it's a national organization that was funded uh, by Kennedy, and a lot of other programs were funded in that time to uh, support people with IDD. Um, and, but it was still using that institutional model, that medical model. And so we didn't really get the 
deinstitutionalization for people with IDD until the 1980s and late 70s because uh, even Kennedy w was like, oh, well, I don't see institutions being bad. We just need to g p give them more funding. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also divided more community-based options as well, so he supported both in a way. But that he, I don't know what his full angle was because there was actually evidence that his sister that had a disability was given a lobotomy. It's a very really interesting story. There was also other national groups that advocated for people with disabilities in other ways. Um, ADAPT, the national organization, they got their start advocating for tr public transit. Their buses did not have accessible, the, in the area that they lived in in East Coast, where ADAPT originated, they, there was no accessible buses. And so ADAPT, the original ADAPT, protested and blocked the buses and blocked the street to protest that there was no accessible transit for people with disabilities. And uh, now they are a national organization and they have chapters all over the country and they um, do protests. And they were also infamous for their protests with crawling up the stairs with the uh, fighting for the ADA. Um, and also implementing the Rehabilitation Act, um, which allowed for people with disabilities to get into general education and to get employment. Um, we also, in Washington, in 1980s, we started, 1990s, we started uh, the IDEA legislation that allowed uh, for special education in our schools. And Washington was actually the first state to, uh, one of the first states to implement that. Um, now for, in the disability civil rights movement, uh, there was some conflicts. And one of the things that happened is uh, the head of the civil rights for people with disabilities were people with physical disabilities. And sometimes they kind of were like, Drawing the intellectually and developmentally disabled and mentally people with mental illness under the bus. Like, oh, our brains are fine. It's just our bodies that have an issue, but our brains are fine. And, and so they kind of allowed for the, the, the oppression of people with IDD and said, well, we shouldn't be oppressed because our brains are fine. It's not, I didn't say oppressed, but they said like, you know, they would use that idea of our brains are fine. And that was, that kind of divided the communities because people with IDD and people with mental illness were like, wait a second, we want to have civil rights too. And so um, now we're starting to actually overcome that and respect the intersectionality of disability and understanding that it doesn't matter what type of disability you have, you deserve civil rights. Um, just want to make sure I did not miss anything because the thing is blocking. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Alexandra need an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Olmsted. So, uh, another, so, a big, dis another, so we had the Americans with the Disabilities Act that was in 1990, and that was passed, and that allowed for things, buses had to become accessible, ramps, all of that now had to become accessible. But we didn't really think about how do we make things accessible for people with intellectual disabilities? How do we make things accessible for autistic people? And so that's, that's kind of the policy way that people with IDD and intellectual disabilities were kind of left out. Um, and even with IDEA and special education, there's still cases of people being put in self-contained classrooms and not being fully included. And so these, these policies that happen they still need to be approved upon. They still have issues because we still have self-contained classrooms. We still have sub-minimum wage. We still have a lot of these uh, things that uh, this 
allow for the discrimination of people, um, but the ADA did do some great work to stop a lot of this discrimination and to stop the discrimination in the first place. And I think that there's actually a lot of people who were there who were just not aware that Friday was not even a thing um, in the city of Friday, but Olmstead and the policy, the decision by the Supreme Court that said that people with disabilities should be allowed to live in the community and they should not be forced to live in an institution. And that the, the state is responsible for providing uh, alternatives to institutional care. Um, now the Olmstead Act has, uh, and so that, that decision allowed the uh, more community-based options for people with disabilities and we can use it to help get people with disabilities out of the institutions if they want to get out of the institution. Um, and now, so those are the bills that um, are really b national bills that affected people with disabilities and really helped them out. Now the self-advocacy movement was directed to people with IDD. And it was, and for Washington State specifically, the biggest self advocacy organization we have is People First of Washington. And they've been around since 1978. And they were made up of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that lived in the institutions. And they, a lot of them just got out of the institutions. And they were starting their own organization for the rights of people with disabilities. And they used people first language because they felt like their label was used to oppress them. The label of mental retardation, which was the label at the time, was used to, uh, to put these people in the institutions. And so they wanted the world to always remember, we are people first. And so that's why people first got its name. And that's why they're very passionate about people first language. Um, now, the DD Act is another policy that has happened recently, and it created uh, the DD Network Partners, which helps uh, guide policy for people with IDD in, uh, around the country and around the, s uh, around the state. And for us in Washington here, our DD Network Partners is the Developmental Disability Council, uh, the AUCD, or actually our USED, of the AUCD. So the, the AUCD is a national organization that got, is um, over the USEDs. And the USED is the University Centers of Excellence on Developmental Disabilities. And they're basically centers that focus on research specifically for developmental disabilities. And they are our network partner with uh, the Developmental Disability Council, which is a, a governor-appointed council. And then you have um, a PNA, which is a type of law firm that advocates for civil rights of people, and they do law, f law cases. Uh, a bunch of lawyers work for PNAs, and our PNA is Disability Rights Washington, and they're the ones that go to for if a person is violating the ADA, and you need a lawyer to help you um, with a case, or if you had a case of discrimination as a person with a disability, uh, Disability Rights Washington is a resource. Um, okay, so we have the Rehabilitation Act here and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, okay, I'm sorry that the slides, I, I, met, I had already discussed these two acts, I thought they were on, I'm, s I'm sorry about that. But um, just to say a little bit more about the Americans with Disabilities Act is um, that act has been around for 27 years and um, they, uh, it had to be updated. Um, recently it got updated, the ADA AA, which uh, they, um, which was, a, it was like a, a modification that they made. I think it added like making sure that they get things accessible for people with sensory disabilities. So. Um, 
what still needs to be done? Well, like I said earlier, we need to have universal design in our education. We need to be able to have everyone included in the same classroom um, and stop this excuse of, oh, well, some kids can't be in the same classroom. Uh, universal design says that we teach everybody and we use different learning styles, teaching styles for different type of students and we have the support be in the classroom where uh, all the students can get support if they need support and we don't have these gatekeeping things where only this student gets to have this and only, I mean that causes so much confusion and resentment and awkwardness for the disabled student Universal design, we wouldn't have those issues. So I, I always advocate for universal design and I even want it in academia and in universities because I think people with IDD deserve to get the same degrees and the same opportunity to get uh, to come into university and to express their knowledge. And so that's my biggest passion. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I love programs like Achieve and others that do promote helping people with IDD get into a higher education. But we still have a long way to go and we need universal de design to do it correctly. <coughs> uh, we need affordable housing. We want to live in a community. We don't want to live in institutions and if we don't have affordable housing, we're forced to live in institutions. And so uh, we need apartments that are affordable. We need um, transportation so that people with IDD can get around in their communities and um, not being able to use the bus at night makes things difficult for people who want to do things in the evening. And so we really need to get that taken care of. And we also need to um, fund support services so that um, people who need caregivers can participate in their communities too and not have to stay home because they don't have a caregiver to help them go out in their communities. And so these are all things we really need to improve upon. Uh, we need to stop forced sterilization of people with IDD. Sadly, this actually still happens today. It, it's not, you know, as much as we did back in the eugenics era, but we still do it. Um, a recent example in 2006, a little girl was forcibly sterilized against her will at C Children's Hospital in Seattle. Um, and the ethics board did not do anything about it. And this little girl now can never have children. They can never um, hit puberty. Uh, they, 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 the chemicals that were given to them makes it so their body cannot grow any larger than a seven-year-old. What medical issues is that gonna cause for that little girl? And this was all done without her consent. And it was all to just make things more convenient for the parents. And I mean, as a parent myself, I can imagine ever doing that to my little girl. But there's some people that think that that's okay to do to people with disabilities and it's okay to do against their consent. And that happens today. And we actually in Washington just had to um, fight a situation where they were wanting to make uh, court ordered for sterilization easier in Washington to do and make the process smoother. And so a lot of advocates, including myself with Self Advocates and Leadership Sale, we, at, we wrote letters to the commissioner saying we, we cannot we do not want this, we don't support this, we don't think that people should be forcibly sterilized. And the process that we have now, we should make it harder, not easier. We, so people even today can be forcibly sterilized by their guardians, by court order, today. And these are the type of battles we fight against because I don't think anyone should be forcibly sterilized against their will. Uh, we need to end discriminatory practices like some minimum wage. Some minimum wage is, the, is, um, is a law by uh, FDR. He made the minimum wage law and he made exemptions in that law. 
And one of those exemptions was for people with disabilities that they could be paid less than minimum wage if you used a C-14 certificate. And so people with IDD have been put in sheltered workshops and even in private businesses been paid less than 30 cents an hour. Um, even at places um, today, people are being paid 75 cents an hour. I even heard of a case of a person being paid 20 cents an hour. And these are people who work just like you and I, and, but they're not being paid equally. And so some minimum wage is something they've actually been, we've actually been able to get it out of Seattle. Uh, this, uh, the mayor of Seattle a week ago signed into law that uh, they can no longer uh, pay some minimum wages. But nationally and statewide, it can still be done. And it is still done in this state. And so we're wanting to get that changed since we want to get the change federally. Nobody should be paid uh, lesser wages because of the disability. Disabled workers work is just as valuable. Um, and the last thing that is a huge concern of mine is House Bill 620. I actually heard, thank goodness, that actually almost, I think it, it's a permanently almost stopped, but I'm not 100% sure. But this bill would weaken the Americans with Disabilities Act. It would actually make it so that businesses did not have to comply to the ADA as soon and as possible as it is now, and it um, makes it so that people have to, people with disabilities have to wait longer to get the accessibility suits through. And so it puts an undue burden on people with disabilities because it also requires them to write down the complaint in physical writing. And for people with disabilities who can't write, they, they can't do that. So they're not able to even, um, advocate for themselves if they are not being able to access a public accommodation. Mm -hmm. So that law, that, that bill, it hasn't passed. It passed in the House, but right now it's, uh, it's kind of in a limbo in the Senate, and we're hoping it won't pass in the Senate. And I think it, because of Senator Duckworth, uh, she may have been able to hold it for a while. But those are the biggest uh, policy concerns that we're really working on. Um, we, we really want to close the institutions. You know, people have been getting abused. Uh, just recently, DRW, Disability Rights Washington, that PNA I told you about, they wrote a huge report about the abuses at those institutions. It's called No More Excuses. And they go into how people are being neglected, uh, uh, neglectful death, like staff not paying attention, and the person like rolls into the water at a, on a deck. Like the, the the staff person leaves them on a deck, and they roll off in their wheelchair and almost drown. Like that's what happens at the institutions. Like it's um, people have been sexually assaulted in the institutions. There has been a lot of abuses and neglect in it even today. And the biggest reason why we can't get them shut down is because people think, oh, there's a safety net. And we don't have a lot of community options. And uh, when I was talking about the deinstitutionalization movement, the big problem with it was when Reagan saw it, President Reagan was like, oh, I like this idea. But the problem was he didn't fully listen to the people. And he thought, oh, let's just get rid of the institutions, but not he did not provide the community-based funding to, to help those people that are leaving the institution get into the community. That's why we have the mass homelessness of people with mental illness in this country. It's because Reagan only did one part, and now we need to do the other part, get that community funding. And the biggest thing for Washington is Washington is spending Bill, million, billions of dollars in the institutions, and that money would be way better served in a community. And so that's what we really advocate for at the legislator. And if you're interested in advocating for that, I would highly recommend you join groups like People First of Washington and Self Advocates in Leadership Sale. Um, we, those are the things we really focus on. And uh, we need everybody on board because these are issues that are still going on today, and it needs to be changed. 
And so that's why I'm here today to tell you about all of these important issues and how we can make it happen. I, I believe in this country. I believe in the people that um, we can do this. I, I, lived, I, I lived in the first five years of my life in an institution. And I was adopted and I came here. And this country was amazing for me. Because my family really fought for my inclusion, I was able to be included. And I want that for everybody with IDD. I want that for everybody, not just for myself, not just for people like me that can speak. I want that for everybody. I don't care if you're nonverbal. I don't care what type of disability you have. You have the right to be able to go to college, get married, have a child, get a house. You have that right too. And I want you to have that opportunity to do those things. It, you know, it may not be right away, you know, and you have to fight for it and you have to advocate for yourself and you have to, and you gotta have support. We gotta have our allies in the room and I really appreciate the allies who can fight for us and help us be able to have the same opportunities as everybody else. All means all. Thank you.